Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Parent Connections. I am very excited today to have with me some lovely ladies from BCC who are going to discuss what services are available to students who had originally received IEP services in a public or private school setting um, and have a discussion about what our rights are as we enter the college environment. Um, for me, this has been a very personal experience as I have transitioned from secondary education to post-secondary education with my student, and I'm hoping they're going to be able to provide us some exceptionally valuable information as I navigate that process and you as my viewers navigate that process that will help us. So I'd like to introduce them. They're going to come on, tell us their names and what their role, are, role is at BCC and we're going to go from there. So thank you ladies again so much for being willing to do this. I really, really appreciate it. So why don't I have Julie, you go first. Uh, your name and what you do at BCC, please. Thank you, Dawn. My name is Julie jodwin Krozik, and I am the director of our Disability Services Office at Bristol Community College. I am Beth Whitehead, and I'm a learning specialist in the Office of Disability Services. I am a part-time learning specialist. There are, there are other people who are full-time and have, um, you know, bigger, bigger caseloads than mine, but um, I work individually with students um, who come into our office. That's actually a great introduction in the sense where I think, you know, as the, the um, population of people who receive IEP services has expanded, as we become more aware, aware of the applications of IDEA and Mass General Laws um, mm -hmm. 76 yeah. and, and, and the application in the public school settings and in the private school settings now with proportional share. And I, I mean, there's a lot of things going on as we move forward in special education. What does that population look like? We'll kind of start there and in terms of that population at BCC and have you seen an in increase in the number of students who are requiring supportive services on campus? Well, I'll take that question. Um, here at, at Bristol, we typically serve about 10% of the student population. So on average, about one in 10 students registers with our office, um, which means that they disclose that they have a disability and that they want to explore accommodations and see if the accommodations are needed to either access, um, generally access the campus as well as the classroom and the academic accommodations that they may need. And um, the students that we work with have a range of disabilities. They may have a more visible or physical disability. So they may be someone who um, ambulates with a, a walker or a cane or a wheelchair. They may have a very traditional visual disability or hearing loss. They may use a hearing aid or they may use a cochlear implant or an American Sign Language interpreter when they're in a classroom. Um, we also have, have individuals with more hidden disabilities. So students who might be on the autism spectrum or they might have a learning disability or attention deficit um, hyperactivity disorder. Um, some students have more of a psychological disability. So something that um, may be anxiety, may be depression. Um, we also have you know, students who have a combination or comorbidities, a combination of disabilities. And um, all of these different pieces make a puzzle that that tends to bring them to our office to say I either in the past have had support and I think I may need that in college or it could be something new for them and they they realize that these types of access supports are available um, to answer your question about an increase I to be, to be honest we have always had a very um, strong representation of students with disabilities feeling comfortable disclosing at Bristol and um, getting the support services that they need so we have consistently been about 10 percent of the population registered oh, interesting. and of course yeah. And over time, you know, of course, we have more students on the spectrum than in the past, but that's reflective of um, the ways in which individuals are diagnosed. Um, and we also have a very uh, strong deaf student population because we have a deaf studies program. So we have um, a higher percentage of our students tend to have a degree of hearing loss because I think we're just very adept at meeting their needs, whether it be um, with note taking, captioning or interpreting. So that's a little unusual. But other than that, I think we're very representative of, of the the disabilities that are present in our in our community as a whole. It's interesting you mentioned accommodations because I definitely want to make sure that we touch on that during this 
conversation. Mm -hmm. So I think one of the confusing points for many families, as was confusing for me moving forward with my own experience, is the, the application of accommodations in the college setting and in the college environment. So students are coming out of school with an IEP, and that IEP under IDEA is only valid for secondary education and elementary education. And then once they enter into college, that document no longer carries over in terms of the legal applications of the accommodations and modifications. So for parents who are attempting to enroll students as they transition, and for students themselves who are transitioning independently, which can happen as well, what do they need to know about the application of their accommodations as they enter college? Um, I can go ahead and start the answer to that question. Um, stu very often we do um, ask students for their most recent IEP and their recent psychoeducational testing from their, um, from their um, K through 12 setting. And we use that as a springboard um, you know, to, to identify a disability, to identify types of accommodations um, that would be appropriate for them. Um, as you mentioned, IDEA um, earlier covers, covers the, the secondary education, and we are covered more by um, the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. And um, there's quite a bit of overlap, but some things don't totally overlap. Um, for instance, um, some of the accommodations, such as extended time for testing or reduced distraction for testing, um, move over into the college setting quite seamlessly. Um, we don't provide any accommodations that actually change the content or the requirements of a course. Um, I think the way we describe it lots of times when we talk about it is that K through 12, the um, special education provides, well, it's aimed for success. And not that we're not aimed for success, because we certainly are, but our office is about access, about having students be able to access the full college experience and have the accommodations that allow them to do that. Now, how one of the concerns that has been brought up to me by parents and I have experienced personally is an unwillingness of staff to um, uh, accommodate students based on the accommodations that are provided um, through an office such as yours an unwillingness, almost as if accommodations are discretionary. Can you kind of touch on that a little bit, clarify that? Are they discretionary on the college level? Because it would be my understanding that they would not be under Section 504 and under ADA, that they would not be discretionary. But I, I was actually informed that they, in some cases, are discretionary. Well, that's a really good question, um, and I, I like the way that, that Beth has, has tried to start to outline the differences between high school yes. and college, you know, in terms of supports and accommodations, and you're right, we are governed by the Section 4 of the 504 Act, as well as the Americans with Disabilities Act and its amendments, and in, in doing that, um, there are many people who are don't necessarily um, share the same understanding that we have in terms of what that means. So it's good to be able to talk about that. Part of our mission is that we work with not only the students to get their accommodations, but we work with our faculty and staff to help ensure that the accommodations are met because they're not discretionary. Um, however, there are times when people think that what they had in high school is equally translated to an accommodation mm -hmm. in college. And I think that's where the discrepancy can come. Um, and then there's also this, this piece where in the college environment, we, we need to work with a faculty member around the um, specific course objectives and student learning objectives that they have in that class. And if the accommodation that's being requested is somehow fundamentally altering that class and the outcomes of the class, it has to be negotiated. And that's not something we would put on a student to do by themselves. Mm -hmm. That's part of our goal is to help a student and a faculty member figure out how to create access in a course but so that the student can still achieve and, may, and show that they've learned the same material, that they can be assessed on the same material, and they're reaching those students learning outcomes, but yet getting the access that they need in order to, to be successful in, in the course um, based on what's what's reasonable. So, you know, I think a great example is that is um, 
an example about flexible deadlines. You know, in high school, there are some students who have much more flexibility built in on their IEP around um, deadlines and extra time. And it's, and it's not necessarily just about a timed assessment. And it may be, well, you know, the, the class is going to wrap up this course, this overlaying project next Friday, but you can have another five days because it sounds like you might need to need a little more time to work on it. And in the college environment, that's not a standard accommodation. So during a timed assessment, many of our students for a variety of reasons are eligible to have extra time and it's not open-ended. It's usually time and a half. Um, sometimes it can be double time. We, we, we do feel that there are cases that warrant that, but it's still again, not open-ended and it's in a timed environment. So instead of a 60 minute Minute timed test, they may come and to our office or work with their professor and have a full either 90 minutes or 120 minutes just to have that extra time for a variety of reasons. But what it doesn't mean if it's a take home assignment that they automatically can pass it in a week later or three or four or five days later. And one of the reasons for that is that these courses are built in a 16 week semester and mm -hmm. the work is typically scaffolded. And, and as you can imagine, we're online now for the majority of our classes, they're um, being taught remotely. So in the online environment, they're also extremely scaffolded. And there's a piece of, of student interaction that needs to be timely um, accomplished. So there are many times when it just isn't appropriate for a student to have deadlines that are being bumped out and out and out, and then still be expected to finish the course in that you know 16 week time frame. That's not to say that any student can't approach a professor and say, you know, we lost power last night, mm -hmm. and I was just about to finish my project and I couldn't upload it. Could I have an extension? Of course, we work with our students to have to really learn how to self advocate for themselves mm -hmm. and develop or with their faculty and be able to um, certainly ask for what they need within reason. But a standard accommodation for extra time doesn't necessarily apply to flexible deadlines in, in, um, in the college environment the way that it does sometimes under an IEP or a 504 plan. So maybe you can, oh, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, Beth, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, not at all. Um, I was just going to say a typical um, exception to that, which would be worked out with a faculty member, would be, um, say, a student who had a hospitalization for mental health reasons. So you know, there, there was no way that they could meet a certain deadline. But in that case, as Julie said, we encourage the student to self-advocate. Sometimes they're not in the position to do that. Um, but we, as learning specialists, would help the student have that communication with the teacher to explain to them the situation. And in college also, there's the um, possibility of getting an incomplete grade in a situation like that, where we would talk with the um, student and the faculty member and say, has this student completed enough of the coursework so that you would feel comfortable assigning an incomplete grade and giving them more to complete it um, after the semester is over? I actually have two questions based on this discussion. Um, one being, how do you distinguish between a standard and a non-standard accommodation? And the second being, do you recommend that families have a FERPA on file for their students? Four cases, just like you mentioned, where you've got a student who is not capable of advocating for themselves, whether that's disability related or it's due to an incident, an unexpected incident that arises over the course of the semester. Um, do you make that recommendation based on those circumstances or just as a general rule? Well, let me take the piece about um, the standard and non-standard accommodations, and then maybe Beth can talk a little about FERPA. <laughs> um, what, I'm glad you asked that because another feature of what our work is, is really working with faculty around embracing inclusive pedagogy, especially from a universally designed um, perspective. So we do extensive work um, across our campus to really embrace universal design for learning. And what we find is that about 60% of our students that register with our office actually request accommodations from their faculty. And we argue that that's because so many faculty have embraced UDL. And in embracing UDL, they are eliminating the need many times for a very standard accommodation. 
for example, many of our faculty have moved away from time testing because for a variety of reasons, time testing um, is not always the most effective way to really measure what a student has learned. And for students with anxiety, um, sometimes students with a vision loss that really need a little extra time to process enlarged print. For many different reasons, students with disabilities are eligible for extra time, time and a half or double time. And by sometimes just taking the time away, it really helps them be able to demonstrate what they've learned. So by using UDL, there are many students who typically would request extra time on a test. They get into, let's say, a history course and they realize that their professor doesn't have any timed assessments. They haven't, they haven't needed to even request an accommodation in that course because it's already universally designed. And that's part of what we would argue that a more very typical standard accommodation like note assistance with um, note taking by using a tape recorder. These are universal strategies that all students can benefit from. Sometimes they're essential for a student with a disability. If a faculty member is already taping their course and sharing that with their students, again, the accommodation doesn't even need to be requested. So it's a very basic standard accommodation that oftentimes is not needed when a course is really universally designed. But there are some accommodations like providing an American Sign Language interpreter that are very specific, very individualized to one one student and their disability that can't necessarily be um, created in, in a standard environment for all courses. And that would obviously need to be um, prepared and scheduled and make sure that it was the right fit for that student mm -hmm. in the course and with some consistency and, and to um, address that. So that to me is more of a specialized accommodation. And that's where, you know, we, we work with our faculty around our students' needs. And sometimes they're, they're very general accommodations, extra time, a tape recorder, um, possibly uh, re testing in an area with reduced distraction. You know, these are very standard accommodations. Some of our other students have more specific needs that are much more, um, much more non-standard or, or more as what I'd like to call specialized. So using an interpreter, using assistive technology. Um, again, we have free screen readers that all students can use, but many of our students would um, do prefer to use Kurzweil. We have licenses for them. They may have other assistive technology at home. We need to make sure that that. Um, that their material is screen reader friendly, that there's, you know, the material, the pieces are in place for their assistive technology to work well. And those would be a bit more specialized. Um, it's not always dependent on the disability, sometimes it's dependent on the, the individual student's needs, but um, that's typically where we would go with, with that. Thank you. Now I know mm -hmm. Beth, you want to answer the FERPA question, correct? Well, yes, and we do um, encourage, um, students if they would like a parent or a family member to have um, the ability to call up and check in with us or talk about their progress um, or, you know, talk about concerns, uh, we would encourage them to um, give their FERPA uh, permission. Um, one of the things, though, we try to make sure that we say to students and, and family members is that that doesn't mean um, that we're going to talk privately to a family member about a student's confidential um, information. It's more that it opens a, a little bit of a doorway to be able to um, you know, have a discussion, especially I'd say the most common way reason is when a student is um, feeling very upset or overwhelmed with something at school and they don't feel comfortable contacting their learning specialist and the parent wants to be able to talk to the learning specialist, kind of get the lay of the land and find out what's going on. So we still try to keep that um, transition to adulthood intact, mm -hmm. even though, um, you know, we, we do encourage people to, um, students to give permission um, if they would like to. Yeah. I want to ask um, you about the collaboration you have in terms of the other departments within BCC, such as the tutoring center and things like that, peer mentoring, if you offer that on campus, um, how do you access that and how do you think it benefits the students you work with on an individualized basis? Well, I think that's a great question because that is one of the distinctions I, I wanted to make sure that we emphasize today is that um, students in K through 12 who have an IEP or 504 plan typically have so many supports built into their day that when they transition into college, there it's a culture shock to really realize that uh, so, you know those supports are there, but they have to be sought out. 
and they have to be requested. And it really has to be an intentional, um, it just has to be intentional in terms of how to use them. So for students who benefit from having um, maybe some individualized instruction and, um, and or have had tutoring in K through 12, Tutoring is available and it's free at Bristol Community College. And we have a variety of options. We have online tutoring. We have tutoring in our learning commons, tutoring that's focused on writing as opposed to content. But um, it's not going to be built into a student's schedule. And they really have to make a commitment to learn where the learning commons is and learn how to get an appointment and be willing to try several different tutors until they find the right match for that course, you know, and to work with us around the strategies that will help develop. How do you prepare for a tutoring session? You know, what, what, what would be a useful thing to bring so that your tutor could help you? Whereas in K through 12, many times the people giving the academic support are already embedded into the course and they yes. know they can predict, you know, what, what the student needs because they've seen their quiz. They've seen how they are attending in class. They know their history. And um, as an adult walking into a tutoring center, you have to remember how to bring all of that. So we really encourage students in their high school years to start developing this bag of tricks, if you will, around understanding themselves as a learner, a learner with a disability and a learner who may benefit from academic supports, but maybe having some insight on what helps them and what doesn't so they can start their and if they haven't done that work, we're going to help them do that work when they get here. But it does take some time to develop those skills. And um, we also really emphasize to our students that our faculty are essentially a, a part of academic support. Faculty have office hours, they have virtual office hours, and they will respond to email, they will answer questions. And sometimes individually, they can really get at um, the question a student has differently than they can in a classroom environment where they're working with you know, 10, 15, mm -hmm. 20, 30 students. Sometimes one-on-one, -on -one, that's all it takes to really a central in. Or they can give them some insight into what to take to tutoring, you know, to really say, I'm glad you came to the office today. I'm, I can see you're struggling with X, Y, Z, you know, why would be a really good thing to work with X tutor on because they are, um, they're really good at, at, at breaking it down in a different way. They tend to use color. They tend to have some re additional resources I know about, you know, um, and there's just so many ways that way. And then you mentioned, I think you mentioned supplemental instruction. Um, that is a form of tutoring that is built into certain classes. And we always recommend that our students take that section if they can of a history class or a psychology class or a science class, math, because this, what it, it does is it has a personalized tutor that really knows the, the instructor's style and is embedded in the class. And it's a little less frightening to approach the supplemental instructor for some tutoring support. They will be offering that in a group format and then individually. And sometimes that could be a really nice transition for students to start to understand how to use academic support services in the college environment because it's such a transition. And I think, you know, that is essential. It's pretty much something we talk about every day. <laughs> mm -hmm. I just left a meeting talking about academic support services, actually. Like, this is a heart of who we are, mm -hmm. especially at a community college. Mm -hmm. You know, this is, for many students, this is the key, the transition that they need to really become effective, independent adult learners. And if you're a student with a disability, those academic support services are often essential. But what's different is they're not an accommodation in college. So I can't provide that as part of the accommodation plan. I can't provide individualized tutoring or a one-on-one -on -one aid that will break things down. However, those resources um, in terms of academic supports are available and can be built into someone's day, especially if they're willing to take advantage of it. I, there are so many things that I wanted to touch on in this interview, and our time is very short together, so we may end up having to, to do a second <laughs> half of to this at some point. But uh, there are a few key points that I want to make sure that I get established during the course of this interview. One being, for a parent walking into this process as the first, at the first time with their student, what and as a student walking into this process for the first time, Minute one, what do they need to know? What, where is their go-to? Where should they be? What should they be accessing first in terms of that process of enrollment and registration and getting the supports that they need at BCC? Um, well, I can, I can give that a try. Um, basically, the first thing they should do is apply to the college. Yeah. <laughs> and, which, you know, and because that, that sets a lot of things in motion um, because they'll apply to a certain uh, major, um, they'll have all their um, information. They'll arrange to have their transcript sent to um, Bristol. And from there, the admissions office will 
um, give them some step-by-step um, uh, plan, a step-by-step -step plan of what to do next. Sometimes it involves placement testing if they're not exempt from placement testing. Um, it'll involve advising, taking advantage of the orientation that's available, and um, also a ref referral to us. Um, you, a, a parent or a student, can contact our office directly and say, um, a member of our family is coming to Bristol in the fall. We'd like to set up an appointment. And what will happen is that we would set up an intake appointment with one of our learning specialists and um, meet individually. And family members can be there too. It's, it depends on the student's comfort level. Mm -hmm. And then we will um, review documentation and um, discuss accommodations and make some um, recommendations for accommodations. So basically, um, that call to ODS can happen, Office of the Disability Services, can happen very early in the process. Um, but applying to the college, I'd say, is the first thing to get the ball rolling. You know, one thing that's wonderful about BCC, and I am an alum, so I, 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 I do have a unique appreciation for the campus and for the professors although it was some time ago, um, is the ease with which applying the, the process of the application is, is really, it's really simplified at this point. There's an ease to that process that um, wasn't always there. They've really streamlined that, especially in establishing connections with every year schools where you've really streamlined that process, you do do a great job of getting into schools and meeting with the students and, and having kind of that quick enrollment process. Um, you, your application fees can be waived and um, it really is an easy process in terms of enrollment. I wanna make sure before we go that you kind of give us, cause it's, it's not only what your office does in terms of providing accommodations, that are considered supportive services for people with um, any type of special education need. There are other things that occur on campus as well that are unrelated to providing accommodations or actually programs in place. And mm -hmm. I wanna make sure I allow you a moment to touch on those and kind of give um, parents an idea of what those offerings are beyond what your office does. Well, I, I, um, I let me, think of it this way we have um a student student affairs division mm -hmm. that oversees um, a multicultural student center mm -hmm. a woman's center a veteran center we have student wellness which focuses on counseling and student student health both physically and mentally um, those services are available to to all students and we are always excited to celebrate the intersectionality of our students. So, you know, many times we'll have a student who is, let's say, an athlete. We have an athletic department with competitive sports teams that provide extensive um, academic support for, for students as well as advisement. You know, many times we'll have a student who is um, an athlete who also has a disability, who's actively involved in the Multicultural Student Center and, you know, and becomes a student leader. And there, there are so many different aspects of the college. We we can't encourage our students enough to get involved in the programming because even though you know traditionally a community college like ours is a commuter school and people are working or they have responsibilities at home and it's a part of what they do it's still essential to be connected with the community at Bristol and to do that by just connecting with one club um, or one volunteer experience you know doing an, a service learning in, in, or some type of civic engagement in a class can get a student connected to just enough people to start to really feel comfortable to ask for help to um, to become a mentor to others and to really start to have that more traditional college experience while they're also balancing the responsibilities of work and home and, mm -hmm. and whatnot um, we also have um, some other specialized programs. So, for example, you we have do. a Macy program, which is um, an inclusive concurrent enrollment program with a variety of high schools in the area. So we do have students who are um, traditionally not necessarily going to earn a high school diploma by passing the MCAS, but are having this transition parallel to their peers. So while they're still covered under IDEA, they are at Bristol and they're taking college courses. They may be auditing those classes and they may have 
traditional accommodations, but additional supports and modifications from an ed coach and, and having the experience of not only being in the class, but being on the campus, volunteering, doing, um, working with a mentor, working with tutoring, being involved in clubs. So that's been um, a wonderful program that um, we've had twice. This The second round is, is, is very vibrant and, and, and very active right now. Um, we, we also have a really active civic engagement program at our college that, that works to try to help students get connected to the community and add a, um, in my opinion, like a service learning or even volunteer piece to their course, which is essential for students with disabilities who maybe have more of a kinesthetic learning style and that that piece can really help with their, their actual learning and, and skill acquisition in a class. So we try to encourage our students to do that. Um, and we also have, we are part of the Commonwealth Honors Program. So we have students um, who have a range of abilities, including students with disabilities who are in the Honors Program and have an exceptional opportunity to take honors classes and then transfer on if, they, if that's something they're interested in with a scholarship and, and you know, just a tremendous amount of, of experience and, and, and breadth and specialized um, programs and projects that they do while they're there. So there's a range of things, but I don't know if I touched on everything. Was there something in particular you wanted us to talk no, about? No, no, no. You actually actually did hit on that point already. I was interested in just having the discussion about the specialized programs because I do know that you offer them on campus mm -hmm. as well and I think it's really important for parents to be aware of that um, mm -hmm. and, and have access to that information. So I'm going to go to Beth before we end because we are out of time. I want you Beth to provide and give you an opportunity to provide the contact information for your office, how parents can get in touch with you, what hours they can get in touch with you, um, what's the best way to contact you? Okay, so right now it's, well, it's called the Office of Disability Services at mm -hmm. Bristol Community College. And um, right now everything is remote. So um, we um, are encouraging people to use our ODS access at bristolcc.edu. So it's ODS a C C E S S at Bristol C C dot E D U. Um, or we do take phone calls, but I would say Ju Julie at this point that we should just stick with the um, with the email access. I mean, we if if it's convenient, we do we do take phone calls. We we do answer the phone. Um, we also return calls because sometimes we're engaged <laughs> with another student. Mm -hmm. we, 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 that is, um, you, you can press zero, you can take extension, you know, 2955. You can also go to our website and mm -hmm. uh, on our website, if you put in Office of Disability Services, there is um, a, a, the link right there. Someone could just click on the email address. There's even a contact me form. They could just click on and just say, you know, my name is, is um, Jane Doe and I have a question about this and um, we'll get that and we will get back to you. Um, we're very really interested in, in connecting with, with individuals. So um, phone, website, contact me form, email. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're happy to answer questions because we know it is, it is, it is a tremendously difficult idea to think about leaving the K through 12 system and transitioning it into is. community college. Mm -hmm. it is. If I could just add one more um, comment on that too, just in general, I think communication is so important. And I think it's really important for <clears throat> students or family members to just reach out and ask a question, even yeah. if we're not the right office, even if we're not the right office. And I always say that to students too, Find out a person, whether it be a learning specialist or your advisor or a faculty member that you feel comfortable with and ask that person the questions. They'll help you find the answers. Um, and I think that's just a really important um, message uh, for students and families to get. I want to thank you both. I couldn't thank you enough. I hope you'll consider coming back on and continuing this conversation at another time. We'd love to have some students come on too and kind of meet with them and, and get a gauge for what their experience has been like. It's been a, a pleasure to have you both on. I, I do really want to thank you very much for being willing to do this and being the first, the innovators on my show, the first <laughs> college to come on and meet with us and, and be willing to have this conversation. So I do appreciate it. And I want to thank you all for parent connecting with us today. Um, my best advice to you through the college process is be persistent, 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 persistent. There are people there that will help you 
find the person that is going to help you um, and get you the information that you need. They are there um, as these wonderful ladies have been today for us. So thank you. And again, thank you for Parent Connecting with us. Have a great day.